This is partly a story about salmon, but really, it's a story about Campbell River. It's a celebration of how the bounty of the returning salmon has shaped the identity of this small Vancouver Island town. Campbell River is much more than just a fishing town. Join your host Kim on this journey and discover the engaging characters that are tied to this town's long and rich history with salmon. The residents are continually adapting to change and creating new and innovative ways to nourish the relationship they have with this iconic fish. Salmon have nourished the First Nations people in the Campbell River area for over 9,000 years. These amazing fish are not only an important food source, but are intricately tied to coastal First Nations cultural identity, spirituality, and way of life. When I was seven years old, I made my first carving. It's still in the school today. 63 years ago, I made that carving. Who taught you this? My father. His name is Sam Henderson. Symbolically, what would the salmon represent, would you say? There's a big source of our food, but yeah, we carve a lot of uh, salmon on plaques and even on paddles. We have a salmon dance. We always have to have twins. I had twin sisters and twin brothers. We all used to do it when we were kids. My Aunt Katie and Dad would sing the salmon song, and. And we'd go and pretend we were cutting a fish. We'd go like this with our hands, preparing the salmon. That's what it's all about when you go like that. I read that salmon represent abundance and fertility and prosperity. And hey, wealth. Without the salmon, where would we be? How did your community food fish when you were a boy? When I was a boy, uh, I, what I can remember is that uh, they never had the same boats. All they had was gill letters. And they went out to supply food, not just for our family, for, for the people on the reserve. And they share. They never wasted one piece of fish. How did the fish get prepared? Oh, they smoke them, can them, barbecue them. And this one that's really excited to see, like the fins they hit, all go in the barrel, wooden barrel, soft it down for the winter. That's why I say they never waste a, a salmon. As early as the 1890s, recreational fishing was a sport in the area. During these early years, Campbell River was quickly becoming known as the salmon capital of the world. This is storied, this place. When did the Tide Club first form? It was formed in a hotel called the Willows Hotel downtown Campbell River, and that was in 1924. There had been a lot of Tai fishing started prior to that in the 1880s. Can you speak to the Indigenous people's involvement? They were our uh, very first guides in the Campbell River area. In 1931, we had the King of Siam come here to row for Tai, and they uh, arranged uh, what I call a royal party of guides, but included indigenous people here. Various First Nations people are mentioned in that 1931 write-up that appeared in the a New York paper about the King of Siam coming to catch fish here. First Nations use the term tai as meaning chief. Okay. Chief, it could be a, a person in the family or the oldest person in the family. And of course, in the salmon world, it was these large salmon. 
We always said there's no money that can buy you a membership in the Thai Club, only landing a salmon, a Chinook salmon of 30 pounds or over, and you will become a member of the Thai Club. Early morning, fish bite better, and late at night, when things get a little cloudy for the fish to see what they're actually looking at, and if you're lucky enough to get your spoon or your plug in front of their face, they just might take a snap at it. As people started to settle in the Campbell River area, fishing continued to grow in popularity. In 1936, Englishman and avid angler Roderick Haig Brown settled here with his wife Anne. He went on to become an internationally acclaimed author and environmentalist. Who inspired your dad? His grandfather. He grew up in his grandfather's house uh, because his father had been killed in the First War. And did your mom grow as a conservationist from being with your dad, or was she in her own right? The, no, I think she mostly learned the conservation from my dad, but she learned it really well. <laughs> she was miles ahead of her time. It sounds like the family legacy has been carried on. Well, because I can't look at something that is messed up without seeing how you can put it right. And uh, in streams particularly. Your dad, in doing his, his work as a magistrate, was also quite vocal about what was happening when the dams were being built. He spent a lot of time worrying about what he could say and, and say well. How did he get his point across? Well, certainly through his writing. He, he did write a lot about it. You know, for Campbell River, the dam was wonderful. There was an awful lot of jobs there. But he could see the damage. He could see what would happen. And of course, it did happen. Campbell River has strong industrial roots. By the 1970s, the entire estuary of the Campbell River was developed, with many prospering businesses situated along the banks. With changing times and an increasing understanding of healthy salmon habitat, efforts to clean up the substantial damage began. Today, the estuary has transformed. Areas are protected, and abundant salmon rearing channels have been developed through the efforts of dedicated local people and organizations. As a result, the Campbell River was designated a BC Heritage River to formally recognize the outstanding community-based stewardship. All five species of Pacific salmon can be caught in the Campbell River area and sports fishing runs deep. All right, there he is. Whoa. Nice one. Here we go. You got the best job on the planet. Yes, I do. How many days are you on the water? Beginning of June all the way till uh, um, right now, here, end of September. What's the one thing that fires you up and makes you come back uh, and do this every year? Well, just the fact of, of the, the expressions on their face when they catch a salmon. Yeah, especially a Chinook salmon, they realize, you know, how hard it is to catch it, bring it in with a single action reel, um, fight the fish, the sport of it. Oh, yeah. We got him. Awesome. OK, we have to talk about the salmon capital of the world. Apparently, we're the salmon capital of the world. Uh, well, I actually believe it. So there's other places that claim to be the salmon capital of the world, and these places um, are falsely uh, informed. <laughs> it's the nicest way I can say it. Uh, Port Alberni likes to pretend that they are, but. We love Port Alberni. Yeah. They're just not the salmon capital. No, no. They can go with a lot of things, but. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> For some, standing in the river with nothing but your thoughts and a fly rod is a powerful way to nourish the soul. I think for me, it's just getting out into nature and I just feel like this is where I've finally found a hobby that really um, helps me focus. As soon as I hear the river, actually, I bubble along with the river. It's hard to explain. And then it takes a few minutes and it just literally feels like the river carries all of the day's worries away. Does it matter if you catch a fish? Not at all. <laughs> that think. also drives my kids crazy, but um, 
it's just a, it's everybody needs to find something a hobby or a, a sport that helps them get into that zen place and and fishing does it for me i'll look up from fishing and just realize where i am and it just blows me away it's beautiful In the midst of all this natural beauty, early Campbell River developed primarily as a resource town and had to adapt to change. As a result, creative businesses have blossomed, helping to turn Campbell River into a world-class ecotourism destination. All right, welcome to Death's New River Adventures, everyone. My name's Jamie, I'll be a lead guide. One of the most unusual adventure tours is offered only here in Campbell River. We do the bottom four kilometer stretch of the river. The upper pool is only about an eight minute snorkel. We do that twice just to get everybody used to the moving water. That was awesome. I'm thinking that this probably draws a lot of tourists. It does. Yeah, it where, does. where are you getting people from? All over the world. Seriously? Yeah. Seriously, all over cool. the world. The, uh, the only continent I haven't hit so far is Antarctica. There you can see all the gray, all through the shallow shit. Uh, big salmon that are holding. Yeah, it's crazy. Look at the school over in front of everybody right now. People come here to experience wildlife at its finest. And with this adventure, we give you the full body experience. Watching the rocks go past you and the shallows, the salmon going past you. It is a full body experience. Returning from the open ocean, salmon bring with them the nutrients derived from several years of feeding in the North Pacific, transferring that to all manner of creatures and the very land itself. One can enjoy this amazing interaction firsthand, simply strolling along the banks of the local rivers or going on one of many wildlife tours in the area. If you look at what's happened here in the last 15 years, Campbell River has become really a, a, a tourism powerhouse within British Columbia because it has some of the best whale watching in Western Canada. It has the best, as far as I'm concerned, the best grizzly bear uh, viewing. All of those wildlife sightings uh, rely heavily on the return of healthy salmon. I think we're a long ways off from, from comparing it to salmon fishing, but Certainly, as, as an economic driver within the Campbell River area, it's huge. So what happens up, up in this area is uh, we end up at a First Nations reserve. The Hamalco people in particular were nomadic people. They lived throughout all of Butte Inlet, which is, which is a number of miles long. And what this does is gives the First Nations an opportunity to have a tourism program in partnerships with companies like ours. Uh, and, it, and it gives us all the ability to extend our tourism season. To say that Campbell River is economically tied to salmon is, is, is absolutely the case. How long have you been involved with salmon in some form or another? 43 years. Starting with commercial? Yeah, and then that lasted for several years and then I eventually got married and had children and commercial fishing was taking me away from home. So I got involved in the sports fishing industry in Campbell River. And now you get to serve salmon to locals and to people that come to visit. Yeah. How cool is that? It's really cool because, like, for instance, the dish that Chef Ashton's going to prepare tonight is yeah. a pink salmon. And I'm a, you know, was a salmon snob because I'm from Campbell River and I can have <laughs> the best of salmon anytime I want one. But um, I. I found a new respect for the pink salmon when we started cooking it here. And I, I was pressured by the Matsunaga family here in Campbell River, who are, you know, three generations in commercial fishing in Campbell River, encouraging me to try pink yeah. salmon. And I was, you know, changed just like that. It's a fabulous fish, and the dish Ashton makes with it is, like, one of my favorites here at the restaurant. Did they give you a recipe to go along with that pink? No. <laughs> they left that to you? They left that to us, but it's a, it's a great dish. I just love it. There's a long history of commercial fishing in Campbell River, including a famous boat. BCP 45 fished the local area for nearly seven decades 
and even graced the back of the $5 bill for many years. She now rests, looking over the waters she proudly once plied. Declining salmon stocks are a current reality, with many differing opinions as to why this is. These changes are making it harder for some people to continue with the way of life they're used to. I'm curious how long you've been a fisherman. 55, 56 years, I guess, around there. Have you seen big differences from when you were fishing as a young man? There used to be lots of fish before, hardly any now. Today, it looked like we got... Oh, 1,400, I figure. Really? You can just, rough you can eyeball that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get pretty close. Say, 40 years ago, when you go out, what would you get in a set? Around the same, what we caught today, because there's no boats out here. So. Where are all the other boats? They're all tied up at home. During commercial closures, fishing is still allowed under the Aboriginal Communal Fishing Licenses regulations. First 25 years of fishing, was it quite stable? Yeah, there was big fleet. Now there's no fleet, so I can't blame it on the commercial fishermen. There's never only 50 of us left out of 500 Zaner. So you didn't see any decline in the first 25 years? No, there were lots of fish. This must be impacting your livelihood. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I had my good years, so not too worried. While commercial fishing boats are left tied up more often and catching less fish, several aquaculture companies have set up their Canadian headquarters in Campbell River to meet the increasing demand for salmon. We are based out of Campbell River and we employ 600 people directly. Our product is uh, mainly sold in North America, uh, from the US to Canada. So with wild fish stocks declining globally and an increase in demand for protein, how is aquaculture positioning itself to fill this need for protein? Well, in a world where we're closely reaching 8 billion people, aquaculture can step in and really take the reins on that. We produce our fish in about 18 months, uh, from smolt to harvest. There are concerns over open net practices and how that might affect or harm wild fish stocks. I believe there's uh, many different factors that are contributing to the wild stock declines. Uh, I believe climate change is one of the biggest ones. Is closed containment a viable option? We are already very familiar with the use of land-based and closed containments. All of our fish spend the first year of their lives in closed containment facilities. In my opinion, going to closed containment on land is not a viable option just due to the amount of land we would have to clear, the amount of energy we would have to use. Carbon footprint would be tenfold compared to what it is today, uh, and we are minimizing it day by day as it is. First Nations people have a unique relationship with the natural world. Atlegate Fishery Society bridges the gap between culture and science. The Society represents five First Nations in the area. Our purpose is to look at the marine resources within the territories and protect those resources for our member nation. Tell us a little bit about the summer youth camp that you offer every year. Uh, we started that probably about five years ago. Uh, what we were wanting to do was get the younger youth in the community interested in what we do. Yeah, on the top step, step more here, is that line? You want to be on the top line of that? We see that there is the resource management side that's taught, but also a cultural component. How important are both of those? Both very important. Um, that's why we tried to mesh them together with the fish identification on one side and then the traditional way of barbecuing. Once they do the summer camp, they'll become a, a summer student and if they like what they're doing, we hope that they'll continue in school. Most of the people that work here, all our technicians come from the community. They're all band members. A few weeks ago, we went to the canyon. What was going on there? What you got to be part of was one of our enumeration programs. The contraption you saw was the rotary screw trap that catches juvenile fish that are then biologically sampled, identified to help count how many there are. We continue this work and in the future we can take what we've done today and 
fly it to keep the salmon healthy for future generations. In Campbell River, the important work being done in the field is supported by a state-of-the-art aquatic research facility. Technology is informing the discussion about salmon health in important new ways. We are a little-known gem of technology that is in Campbell River, and we've been uh, in business as a nonprofit society since uh, 2005. There's a lot going on in here. 15 staff members at current working on everything from ecological work to the finest scale DNA molecular work and detection of pathogens. Hey, is this a fridge? Because it, it doesn't look anything like our fridge at home. This is like a fridge on steroids. This is a minus 80 freezer. Don't put your tongue on anything in there. <laughs> we, we can, so they take it. Oh, look at that. To my knowledge, there's no other lab quite like this um, no. in the province. What's so different about this lab? Well, I think um, a lot of it has to do with the team and the people that we have at BC Cause because they're just, their hearts are really in salmon and molecular work. The other one is, is that we're third party and we're independent. So you can come here and do the work and know that it's not going to be done with bias, that it's going to be done for the greater good. Jim, here in Campbell River, uh, people talk about sea lice quite a bit. Well, sea lice are a naturally occurring element on any salmon and, and other fish as well. The concern is that the that farm salmon are going to be a place for them to reside. And worldwide, some of the strictest regulations on controlling lice numbers on farm fish are here in British Columbia. We're there to help that and add scientific information to make those informed decisions as well. Salmon are experiencing some challenges. I believe, honestly, the, it's environmental issues. The rivers are, are having a rough time. There is also the issues of them coming out and our oceans are getting warmer. You don't think a seal's eating all the salmon? <laughs> no, I, I really don't. There are troubled seal populations in, in different areas, like uh, river mouths. I don't think they're the biggest threat to them. As a resident of Campbell River, what is something that each one of us could do? Truly, uh, just get involved. Get involved in your local uh, community hatcheries and stuff, and actually get out and learn the cycle of the fish and, and what's happening, what's happening into our small streams up and down the coast. The local hatchery offers part-time employment and volunteer opportunities for residents and also offers tours for visitors. To help salmon, it's important for people that are in opposition to one another to work together on solutions. My opinion is that more money needs to be spent and more work needs to be made on salmon enhancement projects. I think the government needs to put stuff in. I think the fish farm industry, if they're going to continue this sort of activity, they need to be responsible as well for taking a part in restoration of wild salmon habitat. Sims Creek has a, a counting fence on it where you know you can volunteer and go down there and count the migrating salmon. Um, all these little groups that, that are, are really um, stewards of what we're doing here and, and they're looking after our coast for us. It, it shouldn't come down to volunteers running the world, but that's what it's coming to. And we need just more people to get involved so they can spread the word of, you know, what is actually happening out there. Throughout time, salmon have been the common thread woven into the very spirit of Campbell River. The residents continue to embrace its connection to the water and the wildlife that call the area home. Moving into the future, Campbell River is in a fortunate place. After many years of living beside and profiting from salmon, it is learning from the past. Salmon are not only a resource to exploit, but are also a part of the natural world to be appreciated and protected. Salmon are a symbol of resilience. In the same way, Campbell River embodies this strength and renewal. Its history and innovative culture has in many ways distinguished it from other coastal communities. The shift to balancing fishing with ecotourism, alongside a passionate community commitment to conservation, ensures that Campbell River will remain the salmon capital of the world.